Well, hello. We're glad you're here. We try to do this every month, and I think we get around to it every four or five months. We're going to try to do better, I promise. We haven't done it so long that Jerry Perry's, uh, our brother, African-American, uh, didn't show because we got some things mixed up. But you have great quality uh, in the gentlemen who are here. My pastor's here, and he knows secrets on me, so I have to say nice things about him. Kevin Labby is the pastor of Willow Creek uh, Presbyterian Church. And uh, then Zach Van Dyke is the pastor of a mega church. And that would be, he hates for me to say it, <laughs> but they add a thousand a week. And it's Summit Church where uh, he's the pastor. And uh, he knows dirt because we've been friends for so many years. Mm. And then uh, in our control room, uh, Jinx is the producer, and he's not ordained. He he says he can be in about five minutes and fifty dollars, <laughs> and if we need him, he'll do it. And then John Myers is our video guy, and he's also in the control room. He doesn't even like pastors, <laughs> but we pay him, so he shows up, and he's an absolute genius. And uh, we've got, if you'll check the video Moses uh, for our <laughs> guest today by the way if you're wondering what you tuned in on this is called a pastor's chat and uh, if you're not a pastor we have a tendency to cuss and spit and tell dirty jokes so please turn it off we don't want that generally known everywhere and if you believe any of that you'll believe anything if you're not a pastor you're welcome to sit in. You have a place at our table, but it's not for you, okay? This is for pastors, and we try to be helpful with it. David Wilson um, is our guest, and he's the director of the ministry we're going to talk about. And I bet a lot of you guys haven't heard about it, and it's a dynamite ministry. I knew David back in his seminary days. He used to take me to the airport. And on those trips, I would tell him about Jesus, and I led him to Christ. He was also a cripple, and I prayed for him, and he got well. And if you believe any of that, you'll believe anything. But David Wilson is the um, director of a ministry to pastors, and I love this title. It's called Bent Tree. Now, let me give you a website, and you ought to go there because this is something exciting that's taking place. It's HTTPS colon slash slash bent dash tree dot org. Is that right, David? That is correct. You got to put in the hyphen or it won't work. A hyphen, not dash. I'll try put to it. remember that. Well, listen, I'm an old guy. I'm doing the best I can. Hey, listen, um, before we do anything else, and we're going to talk about pastoring, uh, tell us a little bit about Bent Tree, some of the things that you're doing, what you're planning on doing. All right. Uh, let me tell two stories first. Well, maybe more than two stories, but two of them have to do with you. Uh, when I was a first year seminary student, I had to do a week long internship. And my old. Uh, Oh, what, what did Kent do? Kent, Kent used to work for uh, Youth for Christ, and he was your singles guy there at Key Biscayne. And so he gave me a, a week-long internship, and he brought me into, the, into your office. And you didn't know me from Adam, and you told me, or you asked me, you said, David, do you love people? Because if you don't, you need to sell paint or something like that. And... <laughs> I lied to you and told you that I loved people because I thought, man, I have done, this is my thing. I, I'm, I'm heading into the ministry <laughs> and I know I don't love people, but if I say that, then I'm out of a job. I'm out of a career. 
So I just lied to you and have dealt that's, with it. Ever so since. you're confessing. That's what you're doing right now. That's what I'm doing right now. That but, will come but, back. Well, wait. Bless you, my child. You're forgiven. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And that story will come back to, to fit into Bent Tree. The other story doesn't. But there was a guy. You said I used to pick you up at the airport. And there was a guy at our school that really wanted to pick you up, but Kent told me not to let him pick you up and that I should pick you up instead. <laughs> and so the first time I picked you up, I pulled up in my little blue Mazda to the airport and I saw you out there. I, knew, uh, I had a picture of who you were supposed to be. And uh, you, you got in the car and I said, well, there's two things I need you to know. One, you can smoke in my car. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and two... There's another guy that wanted to pick you up because he thinks you're great, but I want you to know I think you suck. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, Wilson, we're going to get along just fine. <laughs> and we have. All right. Tell us about you. You got any more stories? I, that's enough, frankly. <laughs> that's you... enough. Man. We can close the prayer. Um, um, this started, I used to be a campus minister with the PCA's. Um, campus ministry, RUF. And we used to get together a lot um, for training and for fellowship and accountability and things of that nature. And then when I became a real pastor, uh, that stuff went away. And me and my friends were trying to get together and hold each other accountable and make sure that we stayed in the job one more year. And there were guys that were falling off like flies, either from sleeping with people that weren't their wives or not getting along with sessions or whatever it was. And we started something and we, this was maybe 2006, 2005, we just started getting together and that kind of grew into something else. And then eventually um, they said, hey, why don't you take it over? And so I just um, started having conferences for guys, pastors that were getting their butts kicked in the church, um, getting their butts kicked because of life, getting their butts kicked because of their own sin and uh, needed a place where they could um, minister to one another. I, I, my deal is if we got healthy pastors, we got healthy churches, we got a healthy society, or at least that's the premise I'm operating off of. And I feel like if I put uh, enough guys in a room together or online together or in counseling sessions or coaching sessions, um, they've got enough stuff in their goodie bag to help one another out mm, that is so good Ed, are you guys safe oh yes we never record anything that takes place at our conferences and our our email listserv is uh invite only hmm. do you uh can a pastor say anything and i mean anything oh yes and they have look, look let me tell you one more story. The the reason when I knew this was going to go from just being a small time gig to a little bit bigger, oh, it was about five or six years ago. And I asked this guy and his wife if I could tell the story, and they said I could. Um, we were sitting around a table talking about the loneliness of of the job, and um, he said, "Well, I got to tell you a story. I, I I went to a church to take over a church and." It was a wreck. And so I started uh, redoing everything. And we finally got the elders to agree to um, to resign their eldership and to replant the church. Mm -hmm. They shut the doors down. They were going to, you know, rename it, uh, remarket it, open it back up in six months. In the meantime, his he and he was being super stressed out by that and not being a very good husband. In the meantime, his wife was struggling with alcohol and she was an alcoholic. And one night he came home and she's hammered and he says, you know, you, you can't do this anymore. And she's like, you need to go out and get me some booze. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. She goes over to the gun cabinet, grabs a shotgun, grabs a, a oh. box of shells and goes into the bathroom. Now, thankfully, she was hammered and she grabbed rifle shells instead of shotgun shells. And she's trying to load the thing. He kicks the door down and and uh, she's crying. And he says, that's it. You got to get help. And I mean, he's telling this to a group of 
I don't know, 40 or yeah. so minutes. Yeah. And we're all on the edge of our seats because it's, you know, everybody's into schadenfreude and we, we like to hear about everybody else's bad stuff. But then he says this, he says, you got to, you either get help or you get out. I'm kicking you out of the house. And and they got little kids and whatnot. And she looks up at him and she says, you can't kick me out. You'll lose your job. And he says to her and to us, I effing hate my job. At that point, I looked around the room and I saw everybody was nodding their heads. And I said, okay, this is something we need to do. Hmm. So yes, it's a safe place to talk. Oh man, that is so good. You know, uh, I I don't want this to be a whiners program where we just talk about, no, just where we all sit around and talk about what horrible jobs we have. You wouldn't be doing this if this weren't important, if the job weren't important, if the calling wasn't important, if the things a pastor got to see weren't incredible and amazing. I mean, this, except for the stuff we're going to talk about, is a high and holy calling, isn't it? It is. And we just had Richard Pratt do our, our October conference, and I told him to talk about both the privilege and the cost uh, of callings because it's, it's a place where you can come in and talk and say how bad it is. And guys will say yes. And they'll listen. And then after a while, relationships are built to where we can go. It is bad, but this is what you're called to do. You're called to be a preacher. You're called to be an evangelist. You're called to be a pastor and a husband and a father and a child and a brother and a friend. And, uh, you need to uh, be reminded of that. So that's what we're trying to do. All right. Hey, uh, by the is, way, I used sorry. to be a member at Willow Creek Presbyterian Church. Oh no way! Was, wow, what year? Well, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would have been eighty nine through ninety two. That's when Pete was there. Wow, that's very early. That's great. Um, I had a question for you. I I think you know if. I had a friend invite me to um, a different event, and um, i just being completely honest. I, you know, ministry jades you over time, get a little mm-hmm. cynical, you, you envision sitting around a room with a bunch of people you don't know sitting in a chair. Um, how do you get guys to open up to that level? Obviously, you're doing something really well. I just am curious how you can take these guys from different environments, been through all sorts of different experiences that probably have made them cynical and hiding uh, from self-protection, how do you get them drawn out like that? Well, part of it is, um, I mean, I know a lot of these guys okay. and, and we don't, with the exception of bringing in Richard, um, usually we do it in house. We just have, I, I just, <laughs> my, um, methodology is the first four guys that sign up for the conference, they're going to be the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and so I tell them, Hey, this is what I want you to talk about. And we'll pay for your, your airfare and your conference fee. We're not going to pay you anything, but that's what, that's what you get to do. And most of them agree to do that. And so they'll talk about what they're, what's going on in their lives. And then there's, oh, three or four other guys that are, will give testimonies and they've just learned that. And they trust me and they trust the the other guys that are around. And we've been able to bring guys into that and say, okay, um, since we already have a relationship and these guys are being open, now you see that you can be open too. Mm -hmm. And it it, it isn't stuffy. And um, I try to keep it at somewhere around 30 to 50 guys because otherwise it gets out of control. And there's plenty of time to hang out. I always tell the speakers, you, you this isn't about you. You're just starting the conversation. The, mm. the money box will be around the fire and out in, you know, in the lodge and all that stuff. Is it, uh, you said by invitation only, um, you, uh, but I mean, what we have probably a number of pastors that are watching or listening right now. And what if they wanted to be a part of this? Can they not? Yes, they can. No, it, it, the the conferences are not by invitation only. Conferences are wide open. Anybody that's got a pulse and a credit card will take. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, the the email listserv where guys uh, can say any anything they want, that's the invitation. Somebody's got to vouch for you because, um, you know, gotcha. there's always going to be some dude that wants to run off and say, guess what I heard. <laughs> um, so if um, – so if guys come to one of these things, what is the, you know, like I, I imagine, you know, it, it is a lonely job at times. I mean, I, I know I feel the most lonely when I'm walking up to the pulpit. Like that is the most, um, yeah. And uh, and there's so many parts of the job where you do feel like, man, nobody, I could talk about this with some people, but they're going to think I'm complaining or they're yeah. not going to get it or, you know, they're going to think, well, you only work on Sunday. So like, why are you complaining? You know, there, there is a lot of loneliness about it. I imagine if you go to one of these conferences though, and then you decide I'm going to open up and I start sharing all this stuff and then you got to go home. Like what is the, what, is there a follow up with the guys that, that, yes, that are part of this? That, that's where we, we feel like if guys come to the conference and they dig it, um, and then they want to be a part of the email listserv where, you know, con- constantly stuff's going on from the, you know, the real anemic, hey, how do you particularize a church or what, what's a, a good communion liturgy to what do you um, do? A life is falling apart um, type stuff. And then we're trying to to get uh, funding for um, subsidized counseling for guys and subsidized coaching. Then you start having relationships and they're got and, you know. Um, there are breakout sessions at each at, at our conference with two or three guys in each group and they're praying for one another and they're getting each other's info and then they're starting to, to have friendships outside of what they've got at their, in their hometown. Hmm. It's what you would hope uh, would be in a session in a presbytery. And we're hoping that that'll be the case at some point. Why does that not happen? You know, yeah. everybody who's watching or listening right now uh, is probably in some kind of judicatory, uh, some kind of connection, an Acts 28 connection or, or a PCA Presbytery or an Episcopal Diocese. And yet, what you're talking about and what's happening at Bentry isn't happening in those places. Why is that? Well, we don't trust each other. Um, I mean, in, in our little weird world in the PCA, uh, teaching elders think that ruling elders are somewhat helpful volunteers and ruling elders think that teaching elders are a necessary evil because they don't want to preach on Sunday. Um, <laughs> and that's, that, that, that's hyperbole to be sure, but, um, we don't trust you. We, we don't tell each other our stories. We don't, yeah. we don't. And and we and at some point somebody's got to be willing to be burned, and Lord have mercy, I've been burned numerous times. But we just put on we put on a face um, because that's what people expect. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can see this or not. Um, hold on, let me get to my phone. Uh, Listen, we can't see it if you're not technologically right. advanced to pull it off. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. We can All right, see that's that. me and my lovely bride, correct? I hope so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you might have some right. explaining to do. Well, what you that that picture was taken five months after Angie got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. Oh man. So she's bald underneath the wig. Um one of the expanders didn't, she had a double mastectomy. One of the expanders didn't take one, the right side of her body looked like a burnt pork loin. So she had a, a yarn <laughs> prosthesis, uh, stuffed in there. And we were going to the wedding, uh, of a person who had caused great distress to, to a child in my family. But in the picture, we look sexy and we got it together. Yeah. Um, yeah, but what in reality, we were just jacked up yeah. and that's just what it, what it is. And at some point you have to tell people I'm jacked up. This is what I really look like. Ken, um, do you think pastors need to do that in their churches? 
And can they get the power to do that by doing it with you guys? Yeah, I, 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 and our hope is to grow this into um, having lay leaders come. You know, I'm, I'm only I'm used to the PCA, so we've got ruling you'll, elders. You'll accept a Baptist, though, won't you? Oh no, my my best friend here in Denton comes, and he's a he's an Armenian uh, charismatic light. Okay, guy. that's cool. Um, yeah, the, we, we we accept everybody. So um, we, we want to get uh, the leaders that are involved in people's churches to start coming to these things, too, so that they can hear what it's like. And then they and then they have their own conference where they can say, yeah, but this is how we feel, too. Mm. And maybe the honest talks will start happening at some point. You had mentioned uh, Presbytery coming from a PCA background, but it would be true of, you know, a district or any number of other bodies. Uh, uh, what kinds of things would you like to see folks who've been transformed through these kind of experiences bringing back to their Presbyteries and other groups to try and cultivate the culture that you're experiencing when you pull these guys out? What, what kind of things can we do as pastors that would uh, make those environments less competitive, less suspicious, less inclined to produce masks and those sorts of things. I'm curious on that. Well, I think uh, if you've got a, a cohort of guys that you get together with, that's awesome. If you don't have one, then we're, we're trying to offer that um, with Bent Tree. But if, if guys from presbyteries would start coming together, you know, a, a sprinkling here and there, they start understanding, oh, that's that guy's story. I mean, I never knew that he was converted out of a strip club or you know, whatever. Um, then they, then it's a little bit harder to demonize him um, over some argument if you know their story. The problem mm -hmm. is we don't know one another's stories. And Presbytery is not the place for a story. Presbytery is a place for, a, for business. Mm -hmm. But if we start coming into that meeting uh, as – friends and co-combatants against the evil one, well, yeah, hmm. maybe something good will happen. Yeah. And I mean, I think our, our congregations need that too, though. They need our story and they need, um, you know, they need to see the pastor as, as being uh, like them. And, you know, I, I stepped into a church situation where the guy had fallen um, and, uh, and had to resign uh, before I came in. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that's the only reason that I'm still there six years later is because I walked into an environment where uh, no one expected the pastor to be perfect anymore. I think the guy before right. me was very much elevated on a pedestal. Everyone loved him. He was a really good speaker, uh, and it was a real shock to the system when he messed up. Um, David, by the way, he committed suicide, too. He he did eventually. Yeah, a, a few months after I came on, he did. Um, but like I said, that that created an environment in my church, at least, where I I felt a little bit safer to to talk honestly about my own struggles. And I do think, pastors, we have to— we have to push that. I know there's there's a line that we probably shouldn't cross, uh, but I think it, we have to be willing to do it from the pulpit, or it isn't going to get any better. Right. You agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. I, I, I think that um, um, there's always going to be a risk, mm -hmm. um, and I, I can either be safe or I can be your friend, and I guess I'll just choose to be your friend regardless. Yeah, David, we're uh, getting ready to land this plane, but I uh, All right. can can people write to you uh, or somebody on the staff at Bentry? Yes, uh, and get through. Would you give us some contact information? Uh, yeah, they can. If you're comfortable with doing that, oh, that, that's fine. Um, my uh, email is r u f as in Frank. B is in boy, U is an umbrella, Z is in zebra. So that's roughbuzz at gmail.com. I like it. I mean, <laughs> mine is so pedestrian. I'm going to go back in my office and change it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you, and they'll get an answer from you and not yes. the staff person. 
Uh, I am the staff person. I'm everything. <laughs> <laughs> it gets, I, I get exhausted chasing me around my desk. <laughs> David, you're a delight, and you always have been. Uh, maybe we'll check in on you and see how this thing is going. You're doing something really, really important. And, yeah, uh, if you've got a bunch of rich people out there that want to send me millions of dollars, that would help too. Uh, let's do a little bit of development. If you're listening and you think this is a good idea, if you are a layperson who works in a bank or a stockbroker and you have <laughs> a few extra bucks, uh, I, I've known David for a long time, and he will not steal. Uh, he does other bad stuff, but he doesn't steal. So you can trust that every dime will be spe uh, squeezed for the glory of God and the benefit of pastors. David, God bless you, man. Thanks for what yeah. you're doing. I appreciate y'all having me on here. Hey, bless you, brother. All right, man. 